Hello, I'm Dr. Carolyn Kroeniger from the Department of Nutrition at Case Western Reserve University. Today we're going to discuss the pathway of gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis occurs in the fasted state after your glycogen stores have been depleted, about 12 hours after an overnight fast. Let's start with the skeletal muscle. This is my picture here of the skeletal muscle. And the skeletal muscle goes through proteolysis or breakdown of the muscle. And 18 of the amino acids are converted primarily to alanine and glutamine. Alanine goes to the liver and is used as a substrate. Those carbons are used as a substrate for gluconeogenesis. So I'm picking up the pathway now with alanine in the liver. It is transaminated to pyruvate. Pyruvate enters into the mitochondria. So here, my pictorial representation, this box here is my mitochondria. And pyruvate goes from the cytosol into the mitochondria. Remember that during fasting, you also have your adipose tissue being broken down. So triglyceride stores are being converted to glycerol and fatty acids. Fatty acids also come to the liver, and they go through the process of beta oxidation or fatty acid oxidation. This generates an increase of NADH and an increase of acetyl-CoA. These are the regulators for the gluconeogenic pathway. The first step, going from pyruvate to oxalacetate, the enzyme is pyruvic carboxylase, and I've numbered these enzymes, and in the next slide they're written out for you. So enzyme number one is regulated positively by the acetyl-CoA. The NADH from the mitochondria is needed to be transported from the mitochondria out into the cytosol. That NADH, again, is coming from fatty acid oxidation. I'll explain in a minute why you need that NADH. So oxalacetate is converted to malate by malate dehydrogenase. There is a mitochondrial form, and then it is transported through the malate aspartate shuttle. Malate then is converted back to oxalacetate by the cytosolic form malate dehydrogenase. You're taking that reducing equivalent and releasing it in the cytosol. So how you do that is you're really transporting the reducing equivalent by malate, the metabolite of malate. Oxalacetate then is converted to phosphoenolpyruvate, and this is the second enzyme, enzyme number two, which is called Pepsi-K. Phosphoenolpyruvate then, these are the shared steps of gluconeogenesis with the glycolytic pathway, and it is in these steps that you need that NADH for that pathway to proceed. The fructose 1,6-bisphosphate then is converted to fructose 6-phosphate, and this enzyme number 3 is fructose bisphosphatase. Finally, uh, fructose 6-phosphate is converted to glucose 6-phosphate by isomerase reaction, and the final step is glucose 6-phosphatase that cleaves that phosphate off of glucose 6-phosphate, and now you have free glucose. This enzyme is in the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, and once the phosphate is removed from glucose, glucose is now free and can go out into the blood. It's very important to maintain blood glucose because the brain requires a huge amount of blood glucose and the red blood cells also because they have no mitochondria require a great deal of glucose. So both of these are used by all tissues but the brain uses a great quantity as well as the red blood cells. This slide is just, I've written out for you the numbers that I had on the previous slide, one, two, three, and four. This is the name of those enzymes. And the other thing I wanted to say is that the glucose 6-phosphatase is in the ER, while the rest of these are all in the cytosol. The other important thing is that glucose 6-phosphatase is only present in the liver and the kidney cortex. So those are the only two tissues that can perform the pathway of gluconeogenesis.